Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we're going to continue our 10 flaw series by looking at the Imperial Stormtrooper. But before we start, we have to do a little bit of housekeeping. In our last video, we looked at the 10 flaws of the Imperial Class Star Destroyer. I said one of the issues with the design was that the shield generators were concentrated onto the top of the ship and therefore areas far away from the top of the ship had weaker shields, making the bottom of the Star Destroyer a vulnerable area to attack. Many of you pointed out that there is a bulge at the bottom of the Star Destroyer, which might be another shield generator, but according to Canon, that bubble houses the primary power generator, which is kind of another design flaw, allowing your enemy to visually see where your main power source is. There is one more shield generator on the Star Destroyer, and that is at the prow of the vessel, but it's a navigational shield mainly used to stop debris from hitting the ship. So if you do want to attack an ISD, go for its soft, weak belly. The next thing I do want to talk about is a little bit more serious. Recently, in a small village in southern France called Ladonovic, the beaches were closed after a dolphin reportedly raped several beachgoers. Now I know a lot of Americans, Brits, Croatians, basically half the world don't really like French people. But the key word there is people. The French are humans, just like you and me. They're not all that different. And no one deserves to be raped by a dolphin while they're just trying to enjoy a nice swim in the ocean. So we send our best wishes to the survivors and victims of this terrible tragedy. Hashtag horny dolphin gate, hashtag humanity first. Anyway, on to stormtroopers now. We know this video will most likely be controversial because everyone loves or hates stormtroopers. And there's also almost half a century worth of movies, comics, novels, and video games about them, all with contradicting information. So as usual, we'll be trying to focus on Disney's kind of vague canon version of the Stormtrooper, and whenever we really do need to dig deeper for information, we'll go into Legends for a little bit. I truly am sorry if our version of the Stormtrooper is not the same as the one you grew up with, but hey, at least you're not getting impregnated by a dolphin. A Stormtrooper outfitted in full combat armor is one of the most iconic images in Star Wars. Most of us at one time or another have dreamed about putting on that white suit of armor and embarking on a village pacification mission where we get a kick in the teeth of some furry Ewoks. But that awesome looking suit of armor is a classic example of form over function. Stormtrooper armor is made up of an insulated body glove that has 18 separate pieces of armor attached onto it made out of plastoid composites. Now we're not exactly sure how heavy that armor is, but we do know that Clone Trooper Phase 1 armor, which the Stormtrooper armor evolved from, was around 40 kilograms. Phase 1 armor included 20 individual plates of a similar plastoid composite. Clone Trooper armor was known for having excellent protection, but it was also extremely heavy and restrictive. Stormtrooper armor, which shares more similarities with Phase 2 clone armor, should be lighter than Phase 1 Clone Trooper armor, but still is a full suit of armor and therefore quite heavy and restrictive. Armor, since man first strapped a piece of animal skin over his nutsack, has always been a trade-off between protection and mobility. Modern infantry soldiers with a full combat load carry around 30 kilos. That includes a rucksack, their weapons, and all of their equipment. But even all that still weighs less than the Stormtrooper armor by itself. Most modern infantry units only wear ballistic helmets and vests along with a plate carrier with trauma plates protecting the chest and maybe groin and collar regions. Even so, all this protection only weighs around 15 kilos. Any more weight or coverage would limit the mobility and stamina of a soldier. And the idea is really not to test your armor against bullets in the first place. It's kind of a last resort emergency measure. It's just as important to be alert and quick enough to find cover so that you don't get shot in the first place. In my opinion, Stormtrooper armor is way too heavy and also severely limits mobility. Also, unlike the clones, the Stormtroopers weren't always being deployed in giant battlefields. They were mainly used for guard duty or in a peacekeeping role, both of which don't require such heavy armor. On top of that, the heavy, bulky type of armor that the Stormtroopers wore really limited their ability to move around in tight CQB scenarios that one might find inside of a city or in a starship. Despite its extremely heavy weight, the protection offered by Stormtrooper armor was a bit disappointing. While it did a good job against non-armor-piercing projectiles and fragments and explosions, it didn't do such a great job against blaster bolts. The armor is capable of absorbing and even deflecting low energy bolts, but higher energy rounds are able to easily penetrate the armor. This is why the Empire heavily regulated more powerful blasters. 
So while small blaster pistols, which would be the real world equivalent of a 9mm handgun, can be absorbed by the armor, something larger like Hans DL-44, which would be the real world equivalent of a 44 Magnum or maybe a 45 ACP round, had enough power and force to knock stormtroopers over and overwhelm the plastoid's ability to absorb energy. The Rebel A280 blaster rifle also seemed to have no problem penetrating stormtrooper armor. So not only was Stormtrooper armor way too heavy, it also didn't offer enough protection to justify that weight. A better solution would have been to use a thicker plastoid composite like that found on the Katarn armor of Republic Commandos and fashion that into an armor system. In order to limit weight though, instead of covering the entire body, I would just have it cover the more vital parts of your body like your chest and groin. I'd rather have a smaller suit of armor that actually works rather than one that covers my entire body but doesn't really work all the time. While the Stormtrooper Corps was officially a part of the Imperial Army, most of the time they were deployed on ships, so they were kind of like uh, Marines, or Space Marines. Not only do they help naval troopers with ship security, they also were used as shock troopers for anti-piracy raids and boarding operations. This meant they were constantly being exposed to the dangers of vacuum. Now, despite the fact that they are covered head to toe in heavy plastoid composites, the Stormtrooper's armor is actually not hermetically sealed. This seems like an odd design oversight for a full suit of armor designed for combatants stationed on a starship. In truth, they don't even need airtight suits. Just a small rebreather or oxygen tank would be enough to make sure that they can get back into the ship should they get blown out of an airlock. The suit is environmentally controlled, so if you're only taking a short walk in space, it shouldn't be a huge problem. You can't really talk about how terrible Stormtrooper armor is without talking about its color or lack of color. In recent years, we have been introduced to different types of stormtroopers that are more appropriately camouflaged, but how many brave Imperials have died over the years needlessly because they stuck out like a sore thumb in their environment? Unless that environment is snow or a field of Ewok ashes. Now, it's been said that the armor was white for a variety of reasons, and we did an entire video on that, so you can check that out, but none of those reasons really justify why the armor is white. You know what's worse than wearing white armor in a jungle? That's wearing white armor in a jungle and then being forced to polish it and keep it extremely clean every day for inspection while you're going on daily patrols where you're being ambushed by tiny teddy bears with superhuman strength. On top of that, you have many other different type of restrictions that just made being a stormtrooper kind of horrible. Stormtroopers were far more fanatic and loyal to the Empire than your average soldier, yet the organization was still constantly being monitored by the Imperial Security Bureau. As a matter of fact, on a daily basis, the ISB was downloading the audio and visual feed on every stormtrooper's helmet looking for slackers or traitors. They were even keeping track of whether stormtroopers were taking off their helmets during patrols or not and punishing them if they found out that they were. This type of monitoring and enforcement of rules was not only damaging for morale, it's also a huge waste of resources and manpower. Stormtrooper helmets, another very controversial topic amongst the Star Wars community. Many Rebels who have stolen helmets have reported that they are extremely uncomfortable to wear and also limit your visibility. Ah, uh, helmet! I can't see! On the other side of this argument, you have Imperial Armor enthusiasts and Stormtroopers who have stated that these Rebels don't know how to properly use these helmets and that most of these helmets were actually turned off. Well, we're going to take a middle road on this argument. While having a helmet with heads-up display with navigational aids and communication suite built in is a huge advantage, helmets, along with other systems in a Stormtrooper's armor, including the environmental controls, oftentimes malfunctioned or ran out of battery. At which point, that state-of-the-art helmet becomes nothing more than a useless hunk of plastoid which limits your peripheral vision. Given the unpredictable rigors of combat and lack of reliability of these helmets, one change I would make to these helmets would be to have a removable face mask or a visor, similar to a motorcycle helmet. That way, if your helmet does malfunction, you can just open up the front of it. That way, the stormtroopers won't need to remove their helmets and still have that basic head protection with a good field of view. And also, they won't have to worry about the ISB penalizing them for removing their helmets. Another controversial subject about stormtroopers is how accurate they are. Wow, you really do shoot like a stormtrooper. Last points, too accurate for sand people. Only Imperial stormtroopers are so precise. Again, we'll be taking the middle road. 
I think as soldiers, stormtroopers for the most part were highly trained and very accurate marksmen, but because of their poorly designed equipment, they oftentimes had problems hitting targets. Stormtroopers used a variety of weapons, but by far the most popular small arms that they used was the E-11 blaster. This light versatile carbine weapon was quite useful in a range of situations and even had a non-lethal setting, a good design feature for a peacekeeping force. But one of the main problems was the E-11's simplistic design paired with the bulky armor that the stormtroopers wore. The E-11 came stock with iron sights, but also could be fitted with a small scope. But neither option really worked all that well with the Stormtrooper helmet. This is why during a lot of battles, you can see Stormtroopers aiming from the hip or tucking the rifle against their shoulder, but not really sighting the weapon. I actually think this is the root of the Stormtrooper problem. It's actually quite a simple fix. All you really need to do is include a targeting system for the blaster rifle inside the helmet. There's already a heads-up display built into the helmet, so a Stormtrooper would be able to fire accurately from the hip or even blind fire. Also, while you're at it, put a biometric lock on the weapon so Rebels can't steal it. Stormtrooper training and military training in general in the Empire kind of reminds me of the Hunger Games. The Imperial Stormtrooper training program was designed with a very Sith-like mentality. Cadets were expected to outsmart each other, and competition was so intense sometimes cadets were injured or even died. And as long as you weren't caught in the act of sabotaging or killing another student, the instructors usually turned a blind eye. While this strategy might work in the business world, it's actually a terrible mindset to have when you're creating a military organization. What made the clone troopers so effective was that they all saw each other as brothers and fully trusted one another. Clones were so closely attuned to their fellow brothers that they were able to protect each other's movements, making them an extremely effective combat force. The Stormtrooper Corps and the Empire in general is full of sycophants, opportunists, and also psychopaths, which a lot of times meant that you had individuals within the organization fighting against each other instead of fighting together for the Empire. While most Stormtroopers were given first aid training, they were oftentimes too busy during a battle to stop and treat their fellow wounded. While all Stormtroopers have some basic first aid training, they are oftentimes way too busy in the middle of a firefight to stop and help the wounded. As a matter of fact, official Imperial policy forbade Stormtroopers to go and aid their fallen comrades until the enemy was eliminated. This meant a lot of Stormtroopers needlessly bled out because no one was able to reach them in time to stabilize their wound. The Stormtrooper Corps did have medics, but they were quite rare and we really never get to see them in combat. The official policy also forbade Imperial medics from treating non-humans, and most medics carried an E-11 for self-defense or if some alien scum started bothering them for treatment. In general, I think a quick way to reduce casualties is to just have more medics. As we mentioned before, the Stormtroopers were like the Marines of the Star Wars galaxy. Some might even call them Special Forces. The point is, they were mainly focused and trained on direct action. But a lot of times, the Stormtroopers were sent on mundane tasks which wasted their time. That would be followed by intense periods of non-stop fighting against heavily rebel cells. The Stormtroopers were basically used in almost every type of scenario, and there was a real risk of combat fatigue in these units. Sure, they were more capable than their army and able counterparts, but having them constantly go on missions and patrols wore them out. On board a naval vessel, the Navy Trooper should handle ship security, and on the ground, the Army Trooper should be deployed as garrisons. Stormtroopers should only be used as shock troops. That's what they're trained and equipped for. Yet we continue to see overwhelming evidence that Stormtroopers were the most widely deployed units despite being a much smaller branch of the armed forces. In Iraq, American trained commando units are doing the brunt of the fighting and have suffered from non-stop deployment and high casualties. I'm worried that the same thing will happen to the Stormtrooper Corps. Well guys, there you go. That is our in-depth analysis on the Stormtrooper Corps. Let me know in the comments section below what I missed. I'm sure you guys have spotted some stuff that we haven't spotted. Also, don't forget to check out uh, the rest of our 10 Flaws series. We've done Star Destroyers and also B-1 Battle Droids. And also let us know what else you want to see. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.